Feeling the jungle vibes today. Hope this podcast finds you well, and I hope you're enjoying my lively jungle start. We are talking about animal behaviour after all, and let's face it, we're all just apes, really. So I know you're probably wondering what's he going on about this time. So I'll stop going on right here, and you'll be happy to hear me say, let's get into some biology. And today the podcast is all about intraspecific interactions. And an intraspecific interaction is an interaction between two members of the same species. Always good to start off with a definition, eh? So as you can see on the screen right now, today's objectives for this podcast. So I'd like to start off with defining what an intraspecific interaction actually is and why animals would interact in this way. And then look at a few sort of general examples of animals interacting intraspecifically and then finally looking at some specific terms such as um, reciprocal altruism and kin selection okay so let's first of all start looking at okay well why do animals um, of the same species interact with one another see if you can come up with a few reasons for yourself to start off with maybe pause me for a second while you have a think Okay, now to explain this, I just want you to have a think about humans, for example, and what it would be like if all humans worked on their own as opposed to working in teams or in groups. And I think you'd see it'd be pretty difficult for us to um, operate and achieve what we do achieve on our own. If you think about when humans were sort of like um, cavemen, um, on their own they'd be able to hunt small animals, but working in groups they'd be able to hunt huge animals like mammoths and things like that. So by working in teams, they were able to actually uh, achieve a lot more. And that's the same with animals. And that might be helping each other out to um, to create something together that they wouldn't be able to create on their own, or it might have just been looking out for each other. And that's what we're going to start by looking at. A few examples of these sorts of things. Now, starting simple, we're just going to look at some just simple behaviours where animals of the same species um, work together for mutual benefit, really. And there's a couple of really easy examples that spring to mind. So if you just look on your screen right now, you'll see some penguins. As you know, penguins are only found in the southern hemisphere, and these ones are emperor penguins found in Antarctica. And, and you can see that they're clumped really, really close together there. And have a think for a second what the purpose of that behavior is. Okay, so yeah, you may have come up with this. I'm hoping you did, but they, they're really in a living, and living in a really cold place, and they want to actually conserve as much body heat as they can. Now, by clumping together like that, they actually cut down on their surface area that's exposed to the elements. So what they actually do is they have a better chance of keeping their heat in the group um, than, for example, an individual that's on their own where the wind and the cold is in contact with the outside of the penguin at all sides. So by clumping together like that, they actually conserve heat. And now on your screen, you can see another example of a similar type of sort of clumping type behavior where you've got fish actually forming a shoal. And by doing this and moving at the same time, they can actually create some quite dazzling effects, as you can see there, which is supposedly able to actually um, put off a predator or confuse them or maybe think that there's a bigger fish that's actually there and so on. So these are just a couple of simple examples of how animals sort of cooperating with one another or animals of the same species cooperating with one another actually works to the group's advantage. And there's lots of examples of similar things to this, like, for example, cows um, or, or things like uh, buffalo and things forming herds so that there's less chance of um, a, a, an, an individual being picked off. The actual group as a whole sort of moves around um, and protecting the weaker individuals in the middle. Birds obviously fly in flocks quite often and, and do a similar sort of thing. They will split and move apart to try and confuse a predator. And often the same when they're flying long distances such as migrations, they do fly in big flocks as they move across from one place to another quite commonly. So just a few some, uh, few uh, examples there of quite simple cooperative interactions between members of the same species. So now I want to look at some more specific examples of these cooperative interactions between members of the same species. And I want to look at a particular term here called altruism and another term called kin selection. So we'll start off with altruism. And on your screen right now you can see the lovely picture of the little meerkat there. 
And um, basically, this is an example of altruism, or it's a famous example of altruism with this species. Um, altruism is sort of like, um, if you look after me, I'll look after you sort of type of behavior. It's sometimes known as reciprocal altruism. And the real definition for what it is, is that you basically, one individual does something for another individual without an immediate benefit for that behavior. So in terms of the meerkat, the famous example is that a group of meerkats will be feeding while one particular meerkat or maybe a couple of meerkats sort of just stand on their hind legs like this one here and just watch over and watch guard and just to make sure that there's no predators on the way. Obviously that's really good for the group, but for the individual who's guarding at that specific time, there's no benefit to them whatsoever because they can't feed. And that's where this idea of reciprocal altruism comes in with the idea that, yeah, they might not be benefiting right now, but give it 20 minutes or so and it's their turn to feed, then they're quite happy that someone's actually keeping a watch for predators for them. And this behaviour occurs in humans and lots of other organisms. I guess it's actually quite a, a big part of our actual sort of way that we behave socially as humans. You know, you open a door for somebody, hoping that ultimately next time when you're, you know, about to walk towards a door, somebody will open the door for you. It's you doing somebody a favour for someone with no immediate benefit right there, but, you know, in the future you hope that will come back to you. Okay, so the second term I just mentioned there, the second specific intraspecific interaction, that's a mouthful, um, is this idea of kin selection. And this is when an individual does something to benefit a member of its family without any benefit to itself. So it's a bit different to altruism where there's this sort of you scratch my back and I'll scratch your sort of mentality. And it's maybe more of a you're a relative of mine so I'm going to help you out. Think of maybe um, a fire in a house and someone's baby's inside. The parents will run inside to try and rescue the baby. Now, it might seem that that behavior has no benefit to the parent that's running into the burning building. But when you actually think about it, there is quite a big benefit there. Think about the similarity there between the parent and the baby or the child. Especially in the fact that the child is carrying the parent's genes. So it's really important to the parent that the child survives so that the genes survive. Now, the same could be said, for example, for an aunt or an uncle to actually run into the burning building to save a niece or a nephew. And although the niece or the nephew aren't sort of direct descendants of the aunt or the uncle, they do have very similar genes. So ultimately, it's seen as beneficial for the aunt or the uncle to save those offspring or the, the niece and the nephew so that they can actually ensure that the genes that they possess are passed on through these children. And we see, we see this in the animal kingdom as well. One example that springs to mind is to take, a, say, for example, a pack of lions. And one lioness might have uh, a group of cubs. And that lioness's sister might not have any children that year. And the lioness without any children actually helps her sister to bring up her own offspring. So she's sort of like the ant lion, if you like, the anti lion. And she basically helps her sister to bring up her nieces, nephews, uh, the lion cubs. And the same thing there, she's not actually helping her own offspring, but the niece and the nephew have similar genes to her own. So ultimately, in an evolutionary way of just thinking about things, she's actually doing something of benefit to herself. Richard Dawkins has a really neat way of summing this type of behavior up and explaining it. If you're not sure, Richard Dawkins, really famous evolutionary biologist, just Google him, you'll find all kinds. Um, his idea is the fact that our genes are actually really, really selfish and the only thing that actually survives are the genes itself. He argues that the idea of survival of the fittest is sort of arguing that individuals survive, but of course all individuals die and the only thing that actually survives is the genes. So he argues that genes are really just competing with one another to survive and the genes that provide the best characteristics for the vehicle or the organism that they're part of will be the ones that are passed on to the next generation and beyond. So he argues that genes actually drive everything that we do, including the way that we interact with one another. So he explains altruistic interactions or reciprocal altruism by seeing it as the gene is doing something for a particular individual, um, knowing that the individual will do something later on to help it and improve its chances of being passed on to the next generation. And in terms of kin selection, genes will make the individual do something beneficial to a relative 
knowing that that relative actually possesses the same genes as itself. I'll post a video on the Wikispace of Richard Dawkins himself actually explaining this. He probably does it a little bit better than me. Um, if you're not understanding that, don't worry about it right now. Just concentrate on the definitions of kin selection and altruism and, and go and watch that at another time. But it really is quite interesting. Richard Dawkins also has a book called The Selfish Gene, which is also quite an interesting read if you get a chance. So that about sums up this podcast, where we really just looked at what intraspecific behaviours are, and, and looked at some specific examples of them, and how they're at an advantage to the different individuals that interact with other individuals of the same species. The next podcast in this series will be looking at how animals interact with one another to actually form social groups and how those social groups are organised and how it's an advantage to be in a social group but also a disadvantage. And we'll also look at how different groups of individuals from the same species, different groups, say for example a pride of lions, interact with other prides of lions. But anyway, enough from me for the time being. I hope this podcast has been useful. As always, take care and keep it real.